please join me in welcoming the Honorable Kel Seliger. Interesting to note that Chairman Branch and I both went to, I think, great private institutions, and one of us had the foresight to drive to College Station this morning and the other chose not to and right. wait around for an airport. So, so the Dartmouth graduate is smarter than the SMU and Oklahoma Christian I would, University I would graduate. never assert that at all. I will assert that. You can just simply sit there and nod your head. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, 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 welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you for having uh, me. With the understanding that you are only recently the chairman of this committee and therefore still have some work to do in getting all the detail uh, 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 together on the big issues you're facing, let's, let's talk about what is likely to happen in the next session. I, I think about this period after election day and before the session as pre-season. Um, in fact, yesterday the freshmen were in town getting some orientation. It's a little bit like pitchers and catchers report in, uh, in spring training. We still have a few weeks before the actual season begins. We remember, however, that last season did not go so well. Uh, the last session of the legislature. It was a tough session for a whole bunch of different issue sets, including higher ed. I wonder if you can tell us whether this season, this session, is likely to be any different from last. It is going to be somewhat different, and I think that there are going to be some more general revenues available. You think more money will be available? I believe so. A lot of it will go to higher ed? Don't pander. <laughs> <laughs> It should all go to higher ed, but given the diversity of opinion in the body, right. it, there will probably be some more divisions made. Clearly, higher ed and public education are budgetary priorities. I think right. that will be reflected in the division of those monies. Right. Uh, and then we get into all the other competing interests that are important interests. Yeah. Transportation, Medicaid, health care. Water. Criminal justice. Water, in some ways, is a different issue because we're going to have to get out of the block of things like formula funding and things like that, which don't exist for water right. and, and really take a visionary view of water because we're planning now for a 50-year planning window. Right. We must plan and act right. in the very near term if we're going to meet the needs of the state of Texas in 50 years. But the point, Chairman, is that every one of those issues is going to be in competition for a finite number of dollars. Absolutely. Right. So why would higher ed deserve, make the case, why would higher ed deserve a greater share of those dollars than any of the other issues? I'll, I'll remind you, I know what you know, that public education sustained in the last session, depending upon how you do the math, right. either a $4 billion or a $5.4 billion cut, either way historic, made a lot of people concerned and unhappy in the state. There's a lot of call to reinstate some of that cut in this next session. Why should higher ed get those dollars as opposed to any of the other issues? You, you, you make an important point that's somewhat of a dialectic point because yeah. I view education as a continuum K through 18, K through 16, K through 20, yeah. not individual silos of public education and higher education here. Right. And so as, as we view them as a continuum, funding for education itself. We educate today for the Texas that we're going to have in the future. Right. It is going to be a Texas of 50 million people and as, as demographers would say, it's going to be a less well educated, it's going to be a poorer population, a population that by definition then is going to require more state services. Right. And, and I, I said when I was a, a relatively small town mayor, we will educate and employ our way through most of our problems. Yep. And that's exactly how we're going to address a lot of the challenges of the future. We're going to educate to those challenges. So you intend to work closely with Dan Patrick, who is the new chairman of public education, to see ways that public and higher ed can align both their priorities and their budget requests so that that money can essentially support education. Absolutely, and we, we have talked regularly. I've told the Lieutenant Governor that either through expansion of the committee or yeah. in shuffling that would be a nice idea for Senator Patrick to be on the Higher Education Committee. I am on the Public Education Committee. Expect to be again. Yeah. I, I, I do, yeah. and, um, and I, I think we ought to work together to see to it that it is a continuum, both fiscally, right. and, but in terms of policy. Is there enough money, let's just isolate higher, I mean, understanding you say that you want to align the two, let's just isolate higher education for a second. Is there enough money for higher education given the aspirations of the state and what you say is undeniably true, the growing population, growing in size, changing in composition? Do we have enough money at the state level to support higher ed at the level that higher ed needs to be supported? Everybody in this room who has any association with a higher education institution will tell you no. Right. If we increase funding 30%, they would still say no. They would still want more money. Yes. Right. And, and, and I understand that and don't necessarily argue with it. So to that degree, no. Yeah. Uh, the point is to make progress. 
and, and to fund as well as we can, given all of the priorities that exist in the state, yeah. then contingent upon those universities yeah. is to do the kind of job the state of Texas needs, a job which I believe in large part is being done. Well, that, that speaks to aspiration, which I want to get to for a second. Let me stay, though, with obligation. My colleague Ross Ramsey wrote a piece in the New York Times within the last couple of weeks in which he referred to the, the, essentially the constitutional provision that the state shall provide a university of the first class. He was writing expressly about the other university, President Lofton, not this one, the other big university. And he, he observed that in 1984, the state was responsible for something like 50% of the share of funding, and now it's down to 13%. And he wondered, at what point does the state default on its obligation to, quote, provide a university of the first class? If it gets down to 10%, 8%, 6%, clearly the trend line is going in the wrong direction. The trend line is going down and, can, and presumably is going to continue to go down. The state's share of higher education. Do you feel that the state is meeting its obligation? Leave aside what people in this audience may want. Are we as a state meeting our obligations? Once again, asking this room, you would hear a, an emphatic no. But what is that obligation? We're starting to ask an, an angels on board pins sort of question there. W what is it? My friend Russell Long, the, the former president of West Texas A&M, said one time when he first got into to, uh, uh, public education that the University of Texas were state supported. Then after a period of time, they were state assisted. And he felt like currently they are state located. Right. And, and, and I see that. I think that public education is a priority. Um, keep in mind that for a vast majority of the people of the state of Texas, our overarching obligation is to tax as little as possible mm -hmm. and to leave that money in the pockets of people who work hard to get it. Yeah. We have to balance that obligation along with all those other obligations. It sometimes surprises me that the, the the, the way things are put in constitutional documents, it shall be the responsibility of the state to provide for public education. What does provide mean? It doesn't say how. It doesn't say how. Uh, to provide an efficient means of public education, uh, what does that mean? Right. Instead of saying the state shall pay 90% of all the costs of, of public education, there's some real constitutional direction. Everything else is a product of, of litigation, debate, negotiation. Right. Well, you, you alluded to the fact that there's a, a climate in this state right now, I can't dispute this, that people don't want to be taxed. Right. Generally speaking, most people would rather not part with their money unless they, unless they have to. The governor, in fact, when he came back from his five and a half month adventure on the presidential campaign trail, picked up this conversation in the form of a budget compact that he put before legislators and others saying, in this next session, we're not going to create new taxes, we're not going to raise existing taxes, we're not going to use accounting tricks, imagine a legislature without accounting tricks. We're not going to uh, uh, take money out of the rainy day fund except for you know, very special one-time uses. He's basically said, we don't have a spending problem, we, have a, we don't have a revenue problem, pardon me, in this state, we have a spending problem. Do, do you agree with that, principally? To a degree. Yeah. Yeah, I do. And, and here's what we found. Yeah. You take the $4 billion or $5.4 billion cuts in public education, and, and after all of, of the teeth gnashing was over what we saw in that biennium, was public education doing in that biennium the way they had the previous biennium, and did a very, very good job. Yeah. Does that mean that, that the less they have, the better that they will do? No, not at all. But those results are not necessarily tied to dollars. Just They're also tied to effort. And right. what we would find is that with a whole lot more money, we would also so see growing educational bureaucracies. We have to protect against that. Yeah. Because is that really better for students right. and the learning process? Yeah. And so we have to, the, the budget compact was interesting because there was nothing new there. Mm. And when it comes to those accounting tricks, as, they, as we call them, perfectly legitimate to do so they obviate the need sometimes to come up with revenue if you delay payments, and they went into a budget that Governor Perry signed. Right. Yeah. It's easy to object to things after you already do them. That's, that's morning after regret sort of, isn't it? Yeah. And so um, uh, we, we have all those competing interests. Right. Both those areas of, of the government that should be funded and the fact that we represent working Texans who also have priorities. And they don't particularly want to see their money leave their no. pockets and go to Austin. They don't. Now, the flip side of saying we don't have a 
a revenue problem, we have a spending problem, can be we don't have a spending problem, we have a failure to invest in the future of Texas problem. We're beginning to hear a lot about that. In fact, some people at the legislature, notably the Speaker of the Texas House, is talking about the need to invest in certain long-term things that may have a cost now, but the cost of not doing something will be greater down the road. He talks about water in that way, and you alluded to water as well, 50-year plan. Do you think we're investing adequately in the future of Texas on, on, on higher ed? I think we're investing the question. Adi the, the word adequately is important and unanswerable. Okay. Yeah. What is adequate? Right. Um, if you look at a strategic plan and you look at the building equipment around this campus, you would have to say yes. Right. There is planning and action being taken for the future. Right. Who will set those standards and criteria for adequate building for the future? Water, in a way, is, is a different issue. There's a sense of immediacy because it has to do with nothing less than survivability and livability. Right. Different issues. Well, it's about metrics. So that if yeah. you turn your tap on in the community of Grosbeck, which ran out of water six or which eight months ago, yeah. right, you turn on your tap and no water comes out, that's a metric of failure right there. There's no water. But there's been a big debate in higher ed about what the appropriate metrics for success are. The old four-year graduation rate as a metric of success is under fire now, for instance. This university has, I believe, Mr. President, about a 50% or so four-year graduation rate, which makes it second among the public university campuses, or at least at one time recently it was second, to the University of Texas at Austin. And then it really falls off from there. We have very respectable universities here that are not graduating in four years, more than 10 or 20% of their students. Is that no longer a metric that tells us whether we're doing an adequate job of providing? It is a metric, but how much different is it from what has always gone on? And, and, and Texas a and is a good example. Yeah. Uh, first and second year retention is outstanding. College gets harder, too. Yeah. And majors get harder. Yeah. Money gets hard to come by, and, and, and there's less financial aid, I think, than was available. Right. There are a lot of factors that go in there, but, but we can also get mixed messages in the discussion of building for the future. And, and without being too critical, but it won't be the first time, um, the University of Texas is talking about building a hundred million dollar system building in Austin. What does that do to build for the future? It's a well, at, at, at a time when they and other systems are complaining about not having enough state funding, and when financial aid programs have been cut and on and on, they're finding that money to build a new. A new and, and so, someone in my position say, "Well, there must not really be a yeah, funding of cash crisis if, because if you're able to build, yeah, it, the funding build crisis. But come back to the graduation rates question okay. because I do really think. You know, a, a President Diana Natalicio at the University of Texas at El Paso said to me more than 20 years ago that re really the way to think about graduation is that there's a local train and an express train. Some kids are fortunate enough to be able to ride the express train, but the diverging, the, the, diver the diverse, pardon me, nature of the student population at universities like that one, and I suspect now every place, some kids work, some leave school to work and come back to school eventually, some are mul uh, juggling multiple considerations. They just can't get through in four years. We ought to be happy for them to get to the destination, whether they're on the local train or the express train, so that the old four-year graduation rate is just a completely, it's, it's completely a non-starter in terms of judging how successful an experience is. It's a starter, but it's not a finisher. Yeah. If you talk to, to, to the president of, of University of Texas El Paso, if you talk to Chancellor McCall in the Texas state system, yeah. they have so many students who are first generation students, yeah. students with limited English proficiency, that every one of those students that walks through the doors is a, 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 a victory, is a triumph to an just, extent. Just getting in there. Yeah. Education is also a benefit in and of itself. All mm -hmm. education, all the things that we learn. Right. Is it definitive in, in terms of future success? Not necessarily. Yeah. Um, but when, when we look at those graduation rates, some of the most interesting things that have come along that I'm most encouraged by that I talked about at Texas Association of Business yeah. is dual credit mm -hmm. in high schools yeah. where for almost no cost at all, students are getting college credit yeah. and at 30 mm -hmm. hours, if they graduate from high school with that, it's 30 hours that, that does not have to be taken yeah. at the cost of a few hundred dollars a semester hour in some cases. It's taking out what I refer to when I have, as I have a son in college, as the fifth year victory lap. Uh, uh, it's taking that out and saving a tremendous amount of money. Right. The other thing that I'm not just excited by but inspired by is early college high school. Right. And I spent some time in, in one. And uh, it was funny because when I walked out of the classroom and I was talking about these kids, only one of whom was Anglo, 
one or two African Americans, and the rest were Latino. Yeah. I said, these kids are wonderful, because right down the line, it was engineering at Tech, one wanted to go into the Navy after getting a degree at Angelo State, and, and one wanted to go to law school, I think, at, at Baylor. And I said, this is, these are just incredible kids, ambitious yeah. and focused. And she said, these are not our gifted and talented kids, the principal. That these were kids in the ninth grade, they're all from, they will all be first generation college students. And college really wasn't on the radar. They expected to get out of high school and get a job. And now they are going to go to college. They're going to graduate from high school, essentially. They're going to graduate from high school and community college at the same time with an associate's degree and a high school diploma in terms of dollar savings and exposure and, and qualification for yeah. higher education, it is an incredible program. Can the state do anything to help along? I mean, a lot of those programs, the early college, high school, and, and, and the like, are, are there's a lot of private dollars that go into supporting that stuff. Foundations like Wins Foundation and others have been on the cutting edge of supporting that stuff. What, what can or should the state do to enable those sorts of things to happen? Or should the state just stand out of the way? If we think that's a, a, good, a good thing. I would have to think dollar for dollar this may be some of the least expensive higher education or high ed higher education entry that we're going to see. I right. think it would, it would behoove the state to put some money into things like early college, high school. Payback is pretty great. Oh, the dividend is tremendous. Right. Um, you, you talked about the, uh, the idea of the, fi the fifth year victory lap, which I know is like a party barge for a lot of these kids, right? They spend it's, the last it's year. It's really kind of what it is. It is pretty <laughs> fun. Um, the, the fact is that we, ha we have an emerging student debt crisis in this country. We hear about how the next great bubble after the housing bubble is going to be the student debt bubble. And a lot of students in Texas, even at the reasonably affordable prices that Texas university degrees can be had, are concerned about the rising cost of tuition. And one of the arguments for getting out of school as quickly as you can is to not incur the additional costs. Um, uh, however many years ago, 10 years ago or so, there was a decision to deregulate uh, tuition. And I know that there's been some discussion about whether the legislature ought to try to get a handle on tuition again uh, uh, 10 years later, going back into this next session. Do you have a point of view about that? whether the, the, the legislature ought to get maybe back into the re-regulating business or whether it ought to provide guidance in terms of how costly a, a college education is? If, there's an, if there is an alternative to regulating or legislating, legislative bodies always ought to look for it. Because if we were to limit it, what do we limit it to? Yeah. And there's a lot of, uh, of definitive type of, of subjects and I talk a lot to, in, in colleges, and, and I represent a district with two universities, six community colleges. And you have to ask some fundamental questions there. Yeah. What should college cost? Yeah. What should it cost? And how much of it should you pay for? And how much of it should the parents and the child pay for? We would like kids to get out of school without too, without too much debt. But at the same time, as, as young people make those debt decisions, not very long after they graduate from Texas A&M, they're going to have some debt. You have a house, you have two cars, you're going to have a bass boat or an RV, and they're going to have the worst, most inexplicable debt that anyone will ever incur, credit cards. Yeah. And so people are not as debt averse as, as, as may think. we might think from this discussion right. of higher education. And, and so we want to keep it modest and, and affordable if we can. It's not ever going to be affordable to everyone. Right. There are going to be a lot of kids that are never going to be able to afford, even with financial aid, to go to Texas A&M. They will still have available to them an excellent and an affordable education and one that is a great value. Somewhere else. Sure. Yeah. And then when we, when we talk about tuition deregulation, I think what I think a lot of the behavior of universities after 19, uh, 2003 was basically licentious. I think if the legislature had known in 1993 how fast tuition rates were going to go up, they never would have deregulated it. Yeah. Ever. I so, also, so, why, so why not re-regulate? Because there may be an alternative. I think that in, which would be what? It would be a limitation of of the universities to some rate that has something to do with inflation. And I think, as I talk to people in universities, I think they've got that message loudly Is that clearly. legislation that you intend to introduce so that you would support if somebody else introduced? Capping, capping the rate of growth of tuition tied to some economic metric? Quite frankly, if Texas A&M system develops it as a policy, why do we have to do it? 
Well, that, that's, not, that's, not any, that's not regulation. I mean, you're saying you would rather just let them self-police. Sure, they do that in a lot of areas. Right. Why not tuition? Well, but if they were going to self-police, why haven't they done it so far? I'm not picking on A&M specifically, but I guess if, if, if the state's position is that, university, that, that if we had only known what universities would have done, we never would have allowed it, but then your position is to say, and now we're just going to basically sternly wag our finger at them and say, self-police and don't do it again? Because the alternative is to say, if you don't do it, we who are kind of ill-prepared to, to, to determine how to fund higher education to do it for you, yes, I think they will. But it, Chairman Branch, well, again, I wish Chairman Branch were here so I could play you off of him yes. in this conversation. <laughs> um, let, me, let me be very candid about that. Um, Cha Chairman Branch has been talking for some time about tying state funding to outcomes much more. Oh, yeah, um, he's I mean, right. clearly, clearly the legislature has both an interest in and an ability to tie the funding piece. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're willing to, quote, regulate in that respect. So why not say to the universities, we just all believe that this has gotten out of hand and we think that you ought to be? Regulation in and of itself yeah. is not necessarily a bad thing. It's what you regulate and how you regulate it. Yeah. To, to require some sort of output, outcome, yeah. is, is not unreasonable. We do that with all state agencies. Indeed. TxDOT's got to turn out roadways that, that are usable and, and meet national highway standards and things like that. Right. Um, criminal justice system has got to keep people in prison when they put them there. Right. It's an outcome. So you're willing to do some of that? Yeah, outcomes are, are good. I, I would argue that they're, they benefit those institutions too. Yeah. Um, you know that the governor in his State of the State address in 2011 was mocked initially for suggesting a $10,000 college degree including books over four years. He's kind of had the last laugh, hasn't he? There are a whole bunch of campuses. In fact, the presidents of some of those campuses are on the program today who've managed to pull those degrees together at $10,000 or so over four years. And now Governor Scott in Florida is following Governor Perry down that path and trying to replicate the program there. Is that one way at this to essentially mandate you shall charge no more than X in some instances for a degree? That's how you keep control of it? We have to be careful about that mandate again because if I tell President Lofton, he's got to, uh, to arrange for a $10,000 degree. Four years from now, in today's dollars, that's an $11,000 degree, $11,000 degree, and if he's still hamstrung by that 10,000, then do we see a qualitative decline. We've got to be care very careful about how we do it. Yeah. What we have seen, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm much less interested in the governor's entertainment than I am on the fact, once again, on the students themselves, it's going to be a tre tremendous bargain, but I think people have some illusions about what that $10,000 degree is. Does anyone think that an 18-year-old is going to show up here in College Station leave four years later and only spend $10,000 on tuition? No. Right, but they might go to Texas A&M Commerce, they might go to the University of Texas in the Permian Basin, two schools that have had some success initially with having a $10,000 degree. Here's a model that we see in place, I think, now. Yeah. And keep in mind that the list of people who are already doing this, I think, is about a dozen schools now. It, right. it's, it, it's proliferating nicely. You're not opposed to the places where it's been able to make work? No. Yeah. No, but what we see is that um, we're seeing dual credit. The $10,000 degree can start in about the ninth, tenth grade. Yeah. With dual credit that, that then segues into the community college yeah. with a healthy online component and then into the university in many cases yeah. for $10,000. It, it, what we need to be careful about doing is prescribe just what model we ought to use. We have some of the smartest, most innovative people in higher education in the state of Texas. Let them figure it out. It's liable to be a lot of models. Yeah. Right. And, and I think that we ought to uh, uh, in, encourage them implementing the model that works. Same thing with the, the fixed income over fixed tuition, I'm sorry, over four years. I wanted to ask you about that. The governor made a, made a stand of sorts uh, a few weeks ago in saying that he believed that a college student entering a public university should have predictable tuition. I think he was thinking about basically a kid knowing going in at the, and the family knowing going in at the beginning of four years, this how much is it going to cost? Is that, you, you support that? Oh, absolutely. It's yeah. the predictability that's important yeah. there. Because if anybody thinks they're going to see, they're going to come in, we'll use Texas A&M, at a very highly discounted tuition yeah. as a freshman yeah. and pay not a nickel more per, per hour or semester at the end of four years, that's, that's the university sort of liquidating itself after a fashion. And so it's the predictability. I think the University of Texas, <coughs> excuse me, Dallas, 
interesting because it's probably the highest tuition in the state of Texas, is doing it now. There is some front loading going on, anticipating increase in costs and things like that. Right. But the value is in that predictability. Here's how much you're going to have to have yeah. for that four years. We've talked uh, once or twice today about the changing nature of the population in Texas. I want to focus on that for a second. You know that we are rapidly moving toward Hispanic majority status in our population. Population is changing. Uh, the first decade of this century, we added 5 million people to our population rolls, 89% non-Anglo. 65% Hispanic. If you look at what the demographers are predicting, in 2000, the, the, the higher ed age population was roughly uh, 3 to 1 or 4 to 1 Anglo to Hispanic. By 2040, it's going to be roughly 3 to 1 Hispanic to Anglo. What do the universities need to be doing that they're not doing now to, to acknowledge and embrace demographic change as a fact of life in Texas, to welcome more kids in, and to realign the curriculum to accommodate the changing population? You'll forgive me, I don't know what it is they're not doing. What I do know is that they very actively yeah. acknowledge that, that challenge yeah. and realize that the, the, the average age of student at A&M San Antonio is 30 years old. You're going to educate that cohort of people differently right. than you are 18 years old, mm -hmm. other than things like reduced beer consumption. <laughs> um, and I think they're adapting to that. And yeah. I think that's why we're, we see a lot of development, certainly in the community colleges, in adult and continuing education. Yeah. If you look at a lot of, of schedules, classes offered at night, and this is in universities as well as community colleges, I think we are adapting to that. When we get into areas that, that developmental areas or remedial areas, which we probably ought to get away from, yeah. um, I think we're making progress there. I think we ought to focus more on the fact that I think the universities acknowledge that challenge and are responding to it. Okay. Uh, let me ask you about politics. You, uh, we, we had a conversation, you and I did, uh, around the time of redistricting, uh, uh, however long ago it was, more than a year ago, and you said, I talked about taking politics out of, can we depoliticize the drawing of maps? And you said to me somewhat famously, I think, taking politics out of redistricting is like taking the calories out of fried chicken. Can't be done. <laughs> Uh, there's a version of that probably for higher ed. It's probably impossible to imagine politics coming out of higher ed entirely. But there are politics that have manifested themselves pretty aggressively on higher ed in the last couple of years. Much of the last legislative session was taken up with a discussion of the governor's higher education reform agenda, which got to financial efficiency, accountability, are professors teaching enough, do we like research, all that kind of stuff. Uh, again, he left for five and a half months to go off on his adventure on the presidential campaign trail, came back, and picked back up that conversation as if he had never left. Are we expecting to have another session consumed by what the governor and his advisors view as the appropriate reform agenda for higher ed? As long as you have politicians uh, with authority in those policy areas, there will always be. I yeah. would say there, there, yeah, there will always be politics. Maybe not yeah. from everybody. Right. I think there are people who focus on policy and, right. and, and things like that. But uh, we shouldn't expect higher education, given the investment in higher education and the profile, yeah. the status of higher education in our society, to, to be devoid of, of politics. But specifically to the reform agenda that the governor put forward, the governor and some of his po policy uh, allies put forward. Do you, do you believe that there's a need for the level of reform that the governor was proposing in the last session? No, well, to a great it extent. Was, it was controversial, you recall. Yes. I'm not, I don't know that I acknowledge it all as reform. Reform, uh, I take to being some sort of progress or some being in some fashion constructive. Right. But in all of those things, I think there, there can be areas that are productive and worthwhile to think about. When you have a situation where 80% of your classes are taught by 20% of your faculty, is that really efficient? From an educational, not just in an economic model, right. is that really efficient? Is that the highest quality education that we can give these young people? Right. Um, President Powers at the University of Texas has talked about he would like to see more courses taught by faculty members and not graduate students. I think that's a worthwhile goal, but it doesn't come without a cost. Right. And so in a, 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 it, w it w wasn't that the ideas were bad. It was the implementation, I think, that was the problem. The public perception right. of the people in West Texas who went to the University of Texas was we had an individual essentially assigned by 
the governor to look over the, the, the shoulder of the chancellor of the university system and tell him how things ought to be done. Right. I don't know that that's really the way it went, but that was a perception. Well, the, other, the, the, perce the perception on some campuses was that faculty were in the crosshairs, that specifically, and on this campus, among other campuses, the concern was that there was going to be essentially a cost-benefit analysis for each faculty member. Is this faculty member doing enough to bring in revenue for the university as if they were working on the bottling plant's assembly line? And the question was, what was the reform agenda improperly directed at trying to gin up more revenue by making faculty more productive? The so-called <clears throat> red and black report, you heard about this. Sure. Course, yeah. Trying to apply a corporate model to an inefficient organization yeah. like a university isn't going to work. Because if we're going to look at the balance sheet on each course, we will not teach comparative religions. We will yeah. not teach a lot of... You'll lose a lot of majors if that's the Yeah, case. we're not going to teach a lot of... Let's. We're not going to teach Shakespeare. Uh, we're going to only teach things like John Kenneth Galbraith and, and things like that. There are a lot of things that we are not going to teach. Right. We are going to limit the intellectual endeavor of the university, which is kind of, in a way, is the death of the university in the Western context, I think. And um, you would not be for it. No, I'm. I'm not for it. At the same time, yeah. uh, that is not the only measure of productivity from a faculty either. And, and the point is well taken. How many more learned papers? How much more are we going to find out about Shakespeare? Mm -hmm. what, what, what else needs to be written? Is, is that the best way to spend the money in some and, cases? I yeah. think it's, it's perfectly legit. Let me ask you about the politics of the Senate specifically. It occurs to me that you can't spell Senate without T. And that is T-E-A, as in Tea Party. And in this session especially, that has never been more appropriate because you've had big turnover in the Senate. You've had five of your colleagues, Republican colleagues, depart, four, four voluntarily, one involuntarily, all replaced by folks who are not just more conservative, but more conservative by a factor of three or five, say. So the Senate is, as a body, going to be more conservative. Is the Senate, and you are probably, I hope this is fair to say, not on that end of the spectrum. So my question is, leading the Higher Ed Committee and hoping to accomplish in a proactive sense, in an affirmative sense, so much policy, are you going to run into the politics of the moment, which is, is that no is a solution in many cases. We don't want to spend money. Government's job is to do least, et cetera, et cetera. Is the Senate going to be a place where many of these good ideas under discussion find a hard time getting any traction? We worry less. I, I think many of us worry less about are the good ideas going to get traction but are the bad ideas going to get traction? I think in, very often we need to worry more about that. About the latter? Yes. Right. If I took, took you to a room in any place in Texas and said, pick out the Tea Party people, you couldn't do it. No, absolutely and, not. And neither could I. Absolutely not. Um, and and I, I'm a fairly typical Republican politician in, in that I'm very much uh, an adherent to a lot of those Tea Party principles. Mm -hmm. But when the Tea Party crosses that line to where it is a micromanaging and a big government thing, then it ceases to be conservative. Mm -hmm. Tea Party is essentially a faction of the Republican Party. It's been, a, been very successful to this point. My point of view, that is, can be a positive thing. Yeah. Does it take us to ideological extremes sometimes? Clearly it does. And so I, I, I worry, is the Tea Party going to stand in the way of good ideas? No, not necessarily. Is the Tea Party going to have some good ideas? Absolutely true. Right. Um, are, are the Tea Party adherents, the self-professed, and you can't identify them either except by profession, uh, going to have some really bad ideas mm -hmm. that are going to have traction because they are going to be held as, as somehow litmus test issues? Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is where I, I diverge from my colleague, Senator Patrick, when he says that vouchers are going to be the voter ID of this next session, voter ID being one of those sort of cornerstone Republican issues. I, I, I believe that is patently untrue. Because? Because you see a great deal of diversity of opinion when it comes to vouchers. It is not something that is universally held among conservatives or Republican conservatives. Well, it's not a partisan divide in the way that many of the issues that we've seen in the last session. No, and, and one of the most signal things that has developed is a discussion that you had with David Simpson, who, who a lot of people consider fairly conservative, mm -hmm. when he says that he will not support vouchers. Right. It, it, it reaches deeply into a lot of, of other issues because the one thing that people never talk about when they talk about vouchers 
is accountability. <laughs> Public and, dollars going to support the education of kids at private institutions that are not subject to the same accountability metrics that the exactly. public schools. How can we have one discussion without the other? Right. And it, 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 it sort of shown through for me at a Montessori school, great school. And I was asked, if, if we take public money, are we going to have public accountability and star test? My answer was, obviously, I don't know. But I can't imagine there wouldn't be. I mean, that's what public schools here get for their right. money, is adherence to an accountability system. Yeah. Um, the, the, we now know, going back, Senator, as we think in retrospect about the 2011 session, that a lot of what went on there from a policy standpoint played out against the backdrop of 2012 politics. <laughs> We had a governor who we didn't know at the time, but some of us suspected was running for president. We had a lieutenant governor who we didn't know at the time, but many more of us suspected correctly was running for the United States Senate. Most of us thought that he actually might win that race, mm -hmm. surprised to discover that he didn't. Uh, we have a governor who is talking about running for re-election in 2014, whether or not we all believe that. We have a governor who's talking about running for president again in 2016, endorsed in some sense yesterday by no less a leading light than Grover Norquist for that job. And we have a lieutenant governor who has all but announced for his reelection in 2014. Is this session going to play out in the same way from a policy standpoint against the backdrop of 2014 and 2016 politics, the way that the 2011 session did in 2012? Or was that just inevitable? I think it's inevitable in a way. I think it's the nature of politics. And I think it's the nature of political aspiration. Yeah. This session, in some ways, may be even more caught up. In politics. With the politics of, yeah. of successive years. Yeah. Every statewide official is talking about running, most of them running for something else. True. Or they're thinking about it. Right. And that is going to shape their political focus. And is that a good thing for Texas? For those of us who have the job that we want and are more interested in, in policy and legislation, no. Because I think a lot of Can't you make them stop? <laughs> I think there will be some effort to, to do so. Yeah. Uh, but I tried to get my wife to quit buying shoes, too. <laughs> um, I, I, I think that we are going to have to push back and make some people realize that the legislature is not the instrument of, of the politics of or certainly they, people, ambition. Right, yeah. particularly of people who are not in the legislative branch. Yep. We have work to do, and we're set there, sent there to do that work by the people in the 31 senatorial districts, the 150 uh, state house districts in the case of, of representative branch. That's what the most important thing to me, or not the politics of, of 2014 and 2016, except with the acknowledgement that I'm going to have to run again in 2014 or 2016. Yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> of all the things that, that Ronald Reagan said that I think were important, I think there were a lot of them. Maybe the most important thing he said is we're not going to run this administration with the thought of how it's going to affect the next election. Yeah. I think that is a good job. How we should run the legislature as well. Yeah. Let me ask a question about you before we open it up for questions from the audience. Um, I mentioned in the introduction that you're a Dartmouth College graduate. Your predecessor um, as chair of higher education was the University of Texas graduate. She had been a public university graduate from Texas. You had grown up in Borger and Amarillo and then went on to Dartmouth College in New Hampshire and came back to Texas. Did going to a private college give you any perspective on these issues different from what someone who had graduated from a public university might have? How does it shape your thinking about higher education? Higher education was a value in, in my family. My, my father was the son of, of immigrants. And he was a success largely because of it. It was a culture in our family. Both of my parents had graduate degrees from the University of Chicago. And so it, there's, there's never been any question about higher education. Yeah. My two sons never had a thought other than they were going to go to college. We were flexible enough to realize that if they wanted to go into pipe fitting and things like that, that was OK. Right. But they needed to know the family value was at least toward more education. And I think that should translate to, to training. When you look at, does it change the perspective if you go to a, a small private college as opposed to a university? Which, full disclosure, we both did. Yeah. Right. I, I, and um, I'd, I'd be interested to know how you feel. Not much. Yeah. I see a great deal of value, in, 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 in this case, mine was a liberal arts education. I didn't have a major until I was a junior or senior. didn't matter. Uh, but in terms of the value of education, um, 
intellectual inquiry, learning. And, and in some cases, that may be the real, real value is that we need to be lifelong learners. And I sort of learned that value. You know what the most important thing I learned was in a, in a private institution? And I'm not sure people see that very much was how to read. Now, I came out of Border High School and I knew how to read, and, and, but how to read critically and understand what you're reading and how it relates to something besides what's between the covers of that book. Yeah. And other than that, I don't see much difference. No, and no I, difference. And I, I look at all the young people that I work with in the Capitol, the vast majority of whom are products of public education in the state of Texas. Um, and look at how well educated they are and how inquisitive they are and, and, and how competent is such a great value to them. I don't see a lot of difference. No big difference. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your time and your generosity.